Well, good evening and welcome to another edition of the San Diego Filmmakers. Yes, right. this is where you get the clap for being here. <laughs> yes. yes. Thank you for being here. So tonight's presentation, Making the Editor's Life Easier, What Everyone in a Production Should Know About Editing. Tonight's speaker has been in the production industry in San Diego for over 20 years. Over the last nine years, he has been the owner of M2 Digital uh, Post Incorporated, where he has worked on corporate, broadcast, and film projects. He is the beloved editor for the Amalgamated Grommets, the multi-award winning 48-hour film project team. That's $5 for that. So let's have a warm welcome for tonight's speaker, Michael Tao. Let me get this straight, Bill's paying you five bucks too? Because <laughs> Bill told me that I had to be funny, and then when he walked in tonight, he showed me that he had a bunch of five dollar bills. And so I guess every time I'm funny, every time you laugh, Bill owes me five bucks. It, never it, it, there you go. So pretty much the plan here is to empty Bill out, and then at the end of the night, we're all going to go over to, I don't know, the Godfather and have uh, martinis. The fried zucchini. So, um, yeah, I, my, my plan tonight is just to kind of talk to you guys a little bit about how you can help out your editors before footage ever gets into the edit bay. Um, I titled it, How You Can Help the Man Behind the Curtain. Now, man's probably the wrong word, it should be person, but it doesn't quite have the Wizard of Oz tie-in with person, so I went with man. Who am I? Nice black and white picture, eh? Black and white makes you more artsy. Uh, I've been in production for 20 plus years in San Diego. Prior to being in production, I don't have a college background in production. Prior to being in production, I was a construction teamster, Local 36 here in San Diego. Um, I drove dump trucks and I hauled heavy equipment for a living. And I did production in the evenings and I did it on the weekends. Um, I spent nine years in corporate production because I got hired by Qualcomm. It just so happened that at the time they bought an edit system that I kind of was the guru in town on. If any of you remember the fast video machine, then you're as old as me. And, um, and that's why I got hired. So I spent nine years in corporate production in-house at Qualcomm. Um, it was a great learning experience, but it was also a soul-sucking experience, <laughs> being in corporate. It, it, but I learned a ton. Um, in 2004, Qualcomm said, we don't want a production company in-house anymore. We're going to farm everything out. You're gone. So my wife actually told me, so start your own business. And I was not the type of guy to start my own business. I came from a family where my dad was a CB in the Navy. And my mom was a letter carrier, so this whole high risk thing didn't work for me that well. I had never learned it, but my wife talked me into it. So in 04, um, I started M2 Digital Post, and I basically told Qualcomm, sell me an, an edit system and outsource work to me. And that's how I started in production on my own. Um, I've been an editor for the Amalgamated Grommets for the last five, six years now. Um, and have had a ton of fun working with these guys. It's been an amazing team to work with. So first off, tell them what you're going to tell them. That's what your teacher told you, right? Tell them what you're going to tell them first. So we're going to talk a little bit about how you can help your editor. We're going to talk a little bit about how writers can help the editor, how the director of photography can help the editor, audio folks, how you guys can help out. And audio folks, you guys are extremely important. And keep in mind that any of us, I mean, we all work on low budget stuff, so any of us can wind up in any of these positions, right? How many of you guys are editors that shoot? How many of you guys are shooters that edit? So if we're talking about, so if I'm talking about something else, pay attention, because you might be there at some point in time. So we'll also talk a little bit about directors, actors, I got some stuff on actors. <laughs> That's another five bucks, brother. <laughs> Um, and, and a couple of tips for editors, how, how we can work a little bit better. Um, three things that I would like for you guys to keep in mind when you're on set. There's three things that really help me out as an editor. 
I need things that are going to help me out with organization, things that are going to help me out with options in the edit, and things that are going to help me out with continuity in the edit. So if you're about to do something on set and you want to you want to do your editor a favor, stop and think of those three things. Is what I'm doing going to help his organization? Is what I'm doing going to help her options? Or is what am I, am I doing going to help the continuity in the film? First, I want to talk about writers. I love writers. As far as I'm concerned, you are the most important person on any film. I said it, the writer's the most important person. Writers, do you agree? Yes. Of course you agree. <laughs> and here's why. I'm going to show you a clip from Fatal Air. This is a 48-hour film uh, produced in 2010 at One Best Picture. Uh, stars Merrick McCartha as Johnny Jade, Kristen Chandler as Veronica Baker, Peter Butenheck as Willie Baker, and a puppet as Rita Hernandez, who happened to be the required character that year. Yes, we put a puppet in the film. Um, just a little setup on the scene. This is a scene between Veronica and Johnny. Johnny's been hired as a private detective, um, and he's letting her know that he's gonna basically get her off the hook. This also, you won't see it in this, but this film was also like a running fart joke. If any of you have ever seen this film, there was a whole bunch of fart jokes in it. Here we go. Fatal Air. Johnny, why don't you want to settle down? I'm the wind, Cheesecake. You can't tie me down. You just have to enjoy me while I'm here. That's a load of crap. So you want some more Joe, hon? Yeah, sure. <laughs> this Veronica Dame was a puzzle, an enigma, a mystery. Really, really confusing thing. Are you talking to me? No, Buttercup. Go about your business. Nothing to see here. The deeper I got into this thing, the deeper it got. Until I got deep. Real deep. Talking to me? No, Rosebud. But I guess I am now. I was a hooska. They toast your nuts? I think you're using that wrong, Johnny. I slipped off the leash, and I made a run for it. But they're looking for evidence, Johnny. Well, they're not going to find any, sweet pea. I paid a visit to the scene, brought home a few goodies. Now I take that to the lab, it's going to come back dirty. And the dirt is going to be on your hands. I didn't mean to kill him. It was that damn Rita Hernandez. I couldn't take the way they were spending time with each other all the time. I just finally just snapped. It was her eyes, those beady little eyes and brown stringy hair and red trampy lips. I just wanted to give her one right between the eyes. Are you talking about this? Talk to Hernandez. You had the gun pointed at Willie, but you meant to shoot Rita. You listen to Dr. Hernandez. Your bloodlust for Dr. Hernandez blinded you to the fact that it was your husband's hand under the puppet. You're not pretty like me. You are floozy. When you let the lead fly, you kill two birds with one stone. Uh, you stole him from me! Floozy. Trophy wife, floozy. When the bullet went through Rita, it hit Willie square in the melon. Stole my Willie from me. Floozy. Dead Lizzy. You are not nice. You bitch. Isn't that right, Veronica? Isn't that right, Veronica? Uh, are you talking to me? So that's, that's why writers are cool. You get to write stuff like that. You get to write dialogue like that. I gotta say, I was so against making that film for the 48. I sat in, um, in our brainstorm session and we started talk, they started talking about fart jokes and I'm like, really? 
Are we really going to make that movie? And it turned into such a cool little movie. And it actually wound up going to Cannes. So yeah, the fart joke film goes to Cannes. So writers, organization starts with you guys. You're going to come up with the foundation of the building that's going to be put together. And that starts with scene numbers. Number your scenes. And it doesn't mean you have to number them when you're writing. Actually, it's probably not a good idea to number them when you're writing, because you're going to get into pre-production and things are going to move around. But by the time it gets to your editor, by the time it gets to production, it's got to have scene numbers. Because that's, that's the if putting the movie together is a puzzle, that's the box top. So what does, what does the editor do with the script when it's, it's in the edit? This is a, this is a script from um, a 48-hour film we did last weekend, weekend before, for LA. So if you'll notice, we've got scene one, scene two. And across the top are the takes. So scene one, take one, scene one, take two. And these lines on them, that's the lines of dialogue, how far it goes through. And this is what I edit from. I take that script and I start lining it out based on the dialogue. If you're editing in Avid, you can go even one step further and import the script into a bin and literally drop your clips onto that dialogue and pull down a line to line it out. So if it, if it doesn't have script numbers, your editor's screwed because that's the roadmap. A table read. Writers, you've got to do a table read. And the table read can be just you. But if you've read it through in your head, you're not done. You have to read it out loud. Because people are going to hear the words. The words are going to go in ears, not in eyes. So you have to read your script out loud. If you can get a table read with actors, even better. But if not, just sit there and read it out loud. Um, I had a script today that I had to read through, and I read it out loud, because it's got to go into the ears. And give your actors a fighting chance with dialogue. Don't give them dialogue that, that nobody in the world is going to be able to deliver and sound good. <laughs> you know, I, the 48-hour film festival, I don't know how many of you guys went and saw all the screenings this year, but there were so many corny lines that it's like you could not, you could not put that line in front of Johnny Depp and make it sound good. You know? <laughs> Bill, you're losing a lot of money. So... <laughs> 250 on those, huh? So, so yeah, write dialogue that your actors can say. And a lot of us are doing lower budget stuff, so you're going to have lower budget actors. So keep that in mind. And again, the only way you're going to know if they can deliver that line is if you hear it. So read it out loud. Use contractions in, in your writing. Didn't. Wouldn't. Your. Because that's how people talk. Unless you're the Coen brothers and you're redoing Two True Grit, or you're doing a film with an all Vulcan cast, <laughs> use contractions. And the other advantage of using contractions is that it can really give impact to a line when you don't use them. Right? Use contractions all the way through. <coughs> Understand that your editor is part of the writing team. You're going to write stuff out, and once it's shot, and once it gets into the edit, things may move around. Um, and I've got an example of that coming up later when I'm talking about directors. But understand that your editor is part of the writing team. All right, directors of photography. Actually, is there questions from writers? Any quick questions? All right, we're moving on. Directors of photography. I love directors of photography. Because you are, without a doubt, the most important person on any film. Yeah. Without a doubt, right, Bill? Yeah, it's, the, it's the director of photography. Writers, I know I said it was you, but it's not. <laughs> it's DOPs. All right, we're going to move on to another clip. This is a clip from Momentum. It was in the 2012 48-hour film festival. Uh, it won Best Picture. And Momentum was a silent film. So this made the director of photography's job even more crucial. 
Um, the scene you're about to see, Vice, the Vice President Bates is played by Merrick McCarthy. His girlfriend is played by Kristen Chandler. And he wakes up in the morning and he notices on the TV there's another report about him because he's a bumbling idiot. But then he realizes that there's another report that comes on that tells him the president's shot and he's now the president. So again, this was a silent film. Yeah, is there any way to lose a little bit of the lights during it? Here we go, momentum. So Bill Bork was the uh, DP on that. Great job on that film. DPs, help me tell the emotional story. That is so important. <coughs> Think about the angles that you're shooting. Think about the framing that you're shooting. With angles, if it's flat, if it's a nice flat, everything is the horizon's perfect. That's a nice, calm angle. But start turning that camera into a diagonal. And now that angle is, is, is different in, in someone's brain, right? It's just upsetting. So think about how you can use those angles. Think about how you can use framing. Think about how you can give your editor, if you have a scene that has to be fast pace and has to throw the audience off a bit. Think about how you can give your editor contrast in those angles, contrast in that framing, um, so that he can cut back and forth and build that tension. The, um, the scene in the bathroom that you just shot, different framing, loose, close. Um, the, the, the scene where the puppet gets shot, right? The framing on that. I actually talked with the um, assistant director on that film, Christopher Francis, because I was on, on set the day they were shooting to get footage, and I said, when you shoot that shot, give me some really tight close-ups, give me some really wide stuff, because I knew in post I needed to screw with people's heads. I needed to get them excited. So to do that, boom, in and out, in and out, right? Wide, close. And it also gives a hell of a lot more impact at the very end when you just sit on that, on that nice flat frame. Oh, I just talked about this. 
Ah, the punch-in. The punch-in is a free shot, right? So if you got a setup and you're shooting a medium shot, shoot the punch-in. What do I mean by a punch-in? Medium shot, punch-in, the close-up. That is a free shot to you. You've already done the setup on this, right? So just run the lines again, do that punch-in, and now I've got options. Remember, that was one of the three things I need, options. So you shoot that punch-in, I now have options. Know your camera and know what lenses to use. The only thing in this world more dangerous than a toddler with a machine gun is an amateur with a DSLR. <laughs> I'm, it's, the DSLR craze is great, but you've got to know how to use the damn thing. You know, just because you can shoot shallow depth of field does not mean you should shoot shallow depth of field. In, in the 48-hour film festival, you know, this go-round, I swear 60% at least overall of all the footage I saw was out of focus. I mean, it was just flat out of focus. And, you know, maybe this makes me an old guy. Maybe I'm not one of the young, hip kids, but out of focus ain't a look. It's shitty video. I get, you know, it's frustrating. Um, so, how do you, so how do you solve some of those issues? Um, one, of the, one of the problems is, is you, got, you have people that, have, that are amateurs, but they've gone out and they bought a DSLR and they're using a kit lens, right? And a kit lens are notoriously slow. So that means you've got to open this thing wide open, right, to get exposure. And what does that do to your depth of field? It shallows it out. So now you have even less depth of field. So do what you can to close that aperture down to buy yourself some more depth of field. Right? Put some more light on it. Up the ISO if you have to, so that you can gain that depth of field that you need sometimes. Trying to run and gun with a DSLR, you're just, you're, you're not giving yourself a fighting chance. I saw a documentary recently, and I wish I could remember the name of it, so it must not have been that good. But um, they shot everything DSLR. They were doing walk and talks with, with, uh, with people on a DSLR, and it was like in and out of focus, in and out of focus, and it just drove me insane. Ah, this is a big one. Slate every shot. And if there is ever a question about whether or not you should slate the shot, <laughs> slate the shot, right? Because that, again, is part of my puzzle pieces <clears throat> to put together. So if we... If you're shooting scene seven, take four, do you slate the shot? Yes. If you are shooting scene eight, take five, do you slate the shot? Yes. If you are shooting scene 15, take 156, do you slate the shot? No, because you would have fired the actor at <laughs> take 150. <laughs> Notice how you always blame the actor, huh? It was really, it was probably the audio guy. <laughs> If anybody's ever been on set, you know what that you know that joke. It's always the audio guy's fault, right? Um, and especially with, with DSLRs, because we're shooting second system sound, so I've got to have that slate so that I can match it up to the audio. Um, editors, we love to edit. We hate to organize, right? Editors, you want to get past the organization. You want to start editing. So when I've got a slate with nothing on it, or I got, you know, some guy, a PA going and walking away. Now, now I've got like four more hours at least for each scene to figure out what goes with what. And I want to edit, damn it. I don't want to be organizing, so please, please, slate your shots. Um, did any of you guys go to the Alex Buono's the, vis the visual storytelling thing? For those of you that didn't, that guy had a great lecture in the evening. The daytime stuff was a lot about lighting, but the evening stuff talked a lot about different framing and angles and things like that that I was referring to. Um, so he's got a DVD on it. So it's visualstorytelling.com is his site. And I would really suggest going and getting that DVD. I learned a ton of stuff from that guy. And he did not pay me to say that. 
Oh, well, this should go without saying, but yeah, make sure your slate scene numbers match your script scene numbers. That's where we go back to the script, right? Because I'm going to match those shots up with scenes in the script. And this is kind of the formula that I use for, for scene naming. And I'll, and I'll actually name my files this when I'm editing. So if you look, I've got an S1AT2. So the S1 is the scene, right? Scene one. The A is the setup. And what I mean by setup, let's say you have a dialogue scene, two people at a table. Your first is your overall coverage shot, so that's going to be A. Your OTS over here will be B, and this will be C, right? So S1A take two. I know that that's scene one. It's my A shot, take two. Um, if you have the luxury of having a data wrangler on site who can name files that way, great. Um, if you're cutting in Final Cut 10 or if your editor's cutting in Final Cut 10, if that, if that on-site wrangler can put, them, put those shots into folders with scene numbers, that's great because I can take them then and import them and it will automatically keyword them with those scene numbers. Directors of photography, don't fall in love with a shot because your editor, I'm just going to disappoint you. You're going to fall in love with this shot. I'm, we're going to get, I'm going to get it in post and it's not going to work because of continuity or it's just not going to work in context. So don't fall in love with shots. And if it helps, just know that I've done a lot of edits that I thought were really cool and got up the next morning and looked at them and went, this sucked. Next. <laughs> Um, for documentary work, this, this one's big for me. If you're doing documentary work, do not shoot with a prime lens. Everybody loves prime lenses, but the problem with the prime is now I've got an hour-long interview with one framing, right? <coughs> you can't change the framing. You can't zoom in on the guy. You can't stop the interview and move the camera back and forth. So don't shoot it with a prime lens. And, and as for each different question, change your framing a little bit. It gives me options. Now, the only... The only caveat to that is if you are shooting with a 4K camera for 1080p delivery, then I don't care because I can reframe it in post. During an interview, uh, when the uh, camera operator is zooming in or zooming out, mm -hmm. during the edit, what would you recommend doing during that zoom? Cutting away to something else or just including the zoom? Well, I would have them zoom in, zoom out in between answers, right? Oh, so. So while, while your producer's asking the question, that's when you're gonna zoom in or zoom out. Um, if you have a servo zoom, also as a cameraman, if you have a servo, servo zoom camera, if you see something that's very emotional and very, is just drawing the viewer in, slowly push that camera in. You know, bring the, bring the viewer in with it. Give me non-specific ECUs, extreme close-ups, because I can use them anywhere, right? While, while your producer's talking with, the, with your interview subject, roll the camera, shoot their hands moving around. That's a great cutaway, I can use it anywhere. Um, I saw a documentary a while back about the auto industry and they went and they shot just a bunch of really sexy like slider moves, jib moves, just on lines of cars, of muscle cars. You can use that anywhere. So think non-specific ECUs, um, those are great. If there's something in your shot with text in it, in the background, or on the guy's shirt, if you can frame it out, great. If you can get rid of it, even better. And the reason why is then that gives me options to flop it in post, right? So if I've got all these interviews that I'm cutting that are all on the right-hand side of screen, and I need somebody on the left hand to mix it up, as long as there's no text in that shot, flip it. I just flip it in post. But if he's wearing a cat diesel hat, and nah, I can't, tack. <laughs> It doesn't work, right? <laughs> I had, a, I had an, an editor I knew one time was telling me about a, um, no, actually, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna save that one. That's for a little later. <laughs> All right, let's talk to audio folks. I love audio folks, and you know why I love audio folks, because you are unequivocally the most important person on any film set. Right <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, I'm going to show you a clip from What's Your Fantasy. This was a film, 48-hour uh, film project for 2011. 
Uh, it won a Best Opening Credits Award. That's the only award the 48-hour film festival has ever given me, but I'm not bitter. <laughs> um, the reason I'm showing you this for audio is we screwed the audio guy on this one. We totally screwed. We not only threw him under the bus, we took him down to the bus depot and threw him like eight buses in. I mean, we totally screwed him. There was about 23 s costume changes, if not more, and some of them were like plastic Roman soldier outfits. Poor Javier, we screwed him. And a guy in a towel. Yeah, where do you put the mic there? Um, so this, this clip, the, the film was about, uh, our, our genre was fantasy, so we decided we would do this film where there's a bunch of people that live in a house, and they have to be like zapped out of the house to go fulfill fantasies and get zapped, and they come zapped back in. Yeah, brilliant, right? <laughs> um, oh hell, I'll just play the clip. Here we go. Hello, I'm here. Where's my little girl? She's on a call. Oh, okay, I'll wait. Hello, Miss Larson, you're looking lovely today. <laughs> Thank you, Robert, you're so kind. Oh, a double. <laughs> Anthony Lewis. Got one for you. You're gonna love this. I don't want to be the one that stands in the corner this time. So what are you doing here, Mrs. Larson? Oh, I just came to see my little girl, that's all. Found it. Anybody want a sandwich? No. Oh, holy cow, that lens is a wild ride, yeah. Ah! Mommy! What are you doing Good here? Good lord, did you do a bad girl fantasy? No, look Oh, you look more like a hooker than a princess? Oh, stop it! Oh, well, in my day, we were more discreet. <laughs> Fantasies aren't like that anymore. Well, I think you should respect your position. Oh, she respects her positions, all right. Oh, stay out of it. Go help Robert make a sandwich or something. My mother and I are talking. That is not what I meant. Well, you said you didn't want to be the one standing in the corner. <clears throat> Please keep it to yourself. Ooh, taking a shower. Robert, I have something for you. Be right there. Yes, ma'am, what's my assignment? It's your favorite. <laughs> you have to be a train conductor? No, now go. I'm getting too old for this. So that was what's your fantasy. That was a really, really fun film that none of us thought through before we did it. <laughs> there was all of these effect shots, you know, the zapping in, the zapping out, all these costume changes. Um, so let's talk about audio. It's been said that audio is at least 50%. I don't think that, I think it's more. Audio is more than 50% of your film. DPs, close your eyes, don't read that. I honestly believe this. If you have to stretch your budget, get a good DP, get a great audio guy. I've, I've worked on short films, independent, low budget, where it was like, let's go get the best DP we can get. Uh, we're out of money, we'll get my cousin to be the audio guy. That is the worst mistake you can make. Because audio is your story. That's the data, that's the information that's going in people's ears and telling the story, right? The picture is the icing on top of it, the beauty on top of it. Audiences will accept mediocre video. They will walk the hell out if the audio's bad. They're up, they're gone. So pay really close attention to audio. Another thing with, with, with audio, with video, if you give me stuff that's slightly overexposed, I can adjust that. If you give me video that's underexposed, I can adjust that. I have a lot more latitude in video. In audio, especially in the digital world that we're in today, once you go past zero and clip that audio, it's clipped, it's gone. There's not a damn thing I can do. We're in ADR, right? We're going to dialogue replacement, and hopefully you have the budget for that. So really pay attention to audio. Audio guys, please always use a boom mic because that's the, that's the audio that I want because it has the ambience of the room in it. It's so much nicer to have that audio 
than it is just a wireless lav. Am I saying you don't use a wireless lav? No, use a wireless lav as a backup. Especially if you're just sitting around shooting an interview, right? If you're shooting an interview, I want a wired boom into the camera or into the zoom recorder and a wireless lav. Because then I don't have to worry about any hits, right? It's wired. So why do you want that lav? There's times, especially shooting interviews, where I'll go to that lav because maybe a car drives by in the background. The body will, the body will block that, that car. But I will always choose a boom over a lav. So please, use a boom. Um, make sure each take is audio slated. Especially nowadays, using DSLRs, second system audio, if you just go in and go, you know, clap and don't tell me what take it is, don't tell me what scene number it is, I can't see that clap on an audio file. So I don't know what audio file that is. I would go one step further and say, when you slate, slate the audio file as well. Zoom recorders, you know, they record with the 001, 002, 003. Scene 7A, take three, sound file 005, click. Right? If you have time, write it on the slate. Because if you write it on the slate, then I don't even have to listen to the audio. Now I'm loving you because you're getting me to editing faster. <laughs> so you've got to slate that stuff. Use headphones. If you walk onto a set and there is nobody on that set with a pair of headphones on, you are so screwed. You've got to listen to headphones. Um, room tone. Please, please, please get me room tone. And for those that don't know what room tone is, you're done shooting your, your scene, everybody just be quiet for 30 seconds and roll. Roll on what that room sounds like. Ambience. Ambience, if you want to call it ambience, that's fine. Um, and why, why I need that, I use it for a couple of reasons. If I need to break up an interview, put space in, into something so it sounds natural, I can't have that room tone go away to complete silence because then I'll hear that break. So I'll use it to bridge that. I'll also, if I have multiple microphones, I'll use that room tone to unify the audio. And what I mean by unifying it is maybe there's more hiss in this mic than there is in this mic. Well, if I have room tone, I just lay room tone through that whole thing, right? And it will unify, it gives the ear something that's, that's consistent, right? So it unifies that audio. You can also use reverb for something like that to help unify audio. So please, get room tone. It takes 30 seconds. Just have everybody clam up and just roll for 30 seconds. All right, let's move on to directors. Of course I love directors. And we know why I love directors, because you are absolutely 120% the most important person on any film. The director. The director and the editor have to have a good relationship. I honestly believe this. You have to have a good relationship between your director and your editor because you have to be able to communicate. You have to be able to say, no, that sucks, whether it's the director or the editor saying that. Right? You've got to have that good relationship. Um, if you, as a director, if you're not getting along with your editor, if it's not working, go find another editor. If you're five or six editors in, it might be you. That's the problem. <laughs> but if you're not getting along, go find another editor. Don't edit your own stuff if possible. And I don't just say this because I want the job. I honestly believe that as, a, as the director, you're too close to it. You, you were on location when it was shot. You know all of those things that happened on location. You're going to fall in love with the shot because it took so much work to get it. Right? And you're going to use that shot even though it sucks. It's been said that the most important thing in an edit is objectivity. And unfortunately, it's the first thing that goes out the window. And I would argue that as a director, it goes out the window before you ever get in the edit bay. Because you just have too much of it. I mean, the, the film that, that we just did, that the Gromis just did for LA, there was a scene in the end of it where one of the actresses is walking across the floor and there's a creak in the floor. And the director, Mike, sent me an email and said, can you get rid of that creak? It's just crew moving around. To me, it wasn't crew moving around. It was a creak in the floor from the actress stepping on the floor. To me, it was on set fully. 
because I didn't know that there was all of these people in the room. That's the kind of stuff you bring into the edit as a director that doesn't need to be there. And what did you say? You told me no? No, I, I, no, I, I told you down. I would knock it down, yeah, because I did agree that it was a little too loud. But you pushed back, which was right. Yeah. What you should do as an editor, push back on your director. If you think that something is, if you think that something is right and something they want to do is wrong, push back. It doesn't mean you're going to get your way, but push back. <laughs> Editors, trust your editor to do the job. I would say that as a director, give your editor the footage, walk away, let them do a cut, or let them do a partial cut, and then come and look at it. Don't sit there and micromanage the editor. Let them do the cut. See what they pick out. They might pick better shots than you picked on set. How many editors in here have gotten logs, and on the logs it's like, yep, take six, or take six, that's the circle take. And you go and look at it, and it's like, no, that's not the circle take. <laughs> you know, this is the take that takes good, but in context it doesn't work. Or, you know, maybe there's a continuity issue with it. So let your editor edit, then come back and look and see what that editor's done, and make changes from there. I'm going to show you a clip. Actually, this wasn't from Inmate. I, I titled this wrong. This was actually from Coverage. This is the film that we did um, for the LA Film Festival. And I just want to show you an example of how an editor can rewrite and edit. And as a director, as a writer, allow your editor to do this. Um, the setup on this scene, this starts with uh, Ellie, who's played by Lorian Hill Purcell, who actually, she just won the best actress in the last 48 for Inmate. Um, and the setup on this scene is she is a news reporter, but she's also a cancer patient, and her, her insurance company has denied her coverage. So because she's been denied coverage, she's basically going to die, right? So this is a scene of her getting ready to do something really bad, I won't tell you what, um, and then it's followed by a scene that was a monologue from the insurance executive that she had dealt with in the past. Right, so this is as it was written, and it was written as two separate scenes. Uh, this is a minute and a half scene, maybe. The, the final piece, all of these, since they were 48-hour films, were anywhere from four to seven minutes. I think this one wound up at about five and a half minutes. And as a result, we've been huge profits. Can you explain that? My obligation is to the shareholders. My obligation is to the shareholders. Everything I do is in compliance with regulations. Due to HIPAA regulations, I'm not at liberty to discuss. Without looking at a patient's file, I can't tell why a client was denied coverage. My obligation is to the shareholders. The shareholders. Everything we do is compliance with regulations. If the SEC has any issues with my filings, they haven't said anything to me. My salary is commensurate with other healthcare executives at my level. You're giving me a death sentence. What do you have to say? I think you finished today. Don't want to live this, Harris? What I did was wrong. I put profits over humanity. People died. I'm responsible for those deaths. This is the only way I can think of to make it right. I'm sending the message over to AGN so the word gets out. I'm so sorry. So that's, that's the way that that scene was originally written and edited. 
And I looked at that scene and I went, no, it needs to be something more. It, there needs to be more excitement. There needs to be more anger. There needs to be just more. And that last line, I'm so sorry, that needs so much more impact. So here, here's how it, it wound up being cut. is to the shareholders. Everything I do is in compliance with regulations. What I did was wrong. Due to HIPAA regulations, I'm not at liberty to discuss. I put profits over humanity. People died. I'm responsible for those deaths. Without looking at a patient's file, I can't tell why a client was denied coverage. This is the only way I can think of to make it right. My obligation is to the shareholders. The shareholders. I'm sending the message over to AGN. Everything we do is compliance with regulations. So the word gets out. If the SEC has any issues with my filings, they haven't said anything to me. My salary is commensurate with other healthcare executives at my level. You're giving me a death sentence. What do you have to say? I think we're finished. Don't want to look at the file, Cyrus. I'm so sorry. So you see the difference in those scenes, the difference in the impact of those scenes? That would have not have happened if I hadn't had a writer and a director that said, go play. Go rewrite as needed in the edit. So as a director, allow your editor to have that kind of freedom. They may come up with some really cool stuff. Um, before you shoot any shot as a director, just stop. Just take 10 seconds and just stop and think to yourself, what is the scene before this? Well, hold on. What is the scene before this? <laughs> as the timeline goes, right, editors? What's the scene before this shot? What's the scene after this shot? This shot? That will save your bacon. That 10 seconds will save your bacon because there's things like screen direction that you have to think about. Um, I talked to an editor once that, had to sh that was hired to edit a war film and when they looked at the footage for this war film, all of the soldiers were all shot, both sides were shot on the same side of the screen. <laughs> you can't have a war scene where everybody's shooting the same damn way. A world war. Yeah, it's a world war. It goes all the way around. Nice. Shit, now I owe Bill five bucks. <laughs> so what's the solution? Flop it and post? Well, I guess, but now they're all left-handed. <laughs> exactly. So yes, yeah, take, that, take that 10 seconds to just stop and think about the shot coming in and the shot going out. Um, and it will, it will save your bacon on, um, on screen direction. And I actually learned that from a camera guy. I learned that from Brad Olander up there years ago when I was directing a project for Qualcomm. And it was like, stop, think about screen direction. Um, test any technical, technical issues with your team first. If you want to shoot a certain camera, um, you know, get together with your DP, get together with your editor, and discuss all that stuff first. The last place you want to find out that your workflow doesn't work is after you've spent all the money on 30 days of shooting. You, know, you don't want to be in that position. So talk it out first. Um, don't forget to be a team me member as, as well as a leader, as a director. Um, I heard a director once say, yeah, you know, I was, I was micromanaging the crew on this and you'll notice about halfway through the film kind of drags because I had to go edit and I couldn't micromanage anymore. <laughs> I don't care how good you are 
If you try and do it all, what you turn out is going to suck because nobody can do it, right? So as a director, be a team member as well. Hire good people. Let them do their job, right? I mean, yes, you do get the final say because you're the guy that's responsible for everything. But be a team member. Listen to your team. Allow them to do their job. Actors. I love actors. Because nobody on a film is more important than an actor. And they know it. <laughs> the, I'm going to show you a clip from Historians. This was done back in 2009. It won Best Something, but I can't remember. That was way too long ago. Was it, was it cinematography? Sorry, I just went Peter Brady on you there for a minute. I don't remember that. Okay, it won something. We don't know what it won, but it won something. Um, this is going to have Peter Butenheck in it again. He plays an alcoholic dad, but it's just the kind of the very last part of his scene. Dalen Matthews, who pay, plays Amy Ballinger, and then once again, Merrick MacArthur, who plays a soldier. This was a, um, it was a superhero genre, and we kind of did a little twist on it. The superhero power was that they could... They could step into somebody's mind and show them a different vision of their past that had, you know, a vision or something in their past that had kind of screwed up their life. Show them a different vision of it to help them in the future. So here's the clip. You need to get past this. What are you talking about? This memory. This pain. You need to see this in a different way. It's not my fault. What are you doing here? You saw me. What was that? How did you do that? Who are you? <laughs> My name is Amy Bellinger. What you just saw was exactly what you needed to move on. He was all right. He was at peace. Yeah, he was. You saw me. Yeah, so? It means you can do what I do. I sit next to people at bars and freak them out? <sighs> That's not what I meant. You can take people back in history and show them a different perspective of their past so they can change their future. It's a gift. You're one of us. Us? They call us historians. And you can tell that that was done in 2009 by that lovely light blast at the end. <laughs> How many of you editors go back and look at stuff like four years later and go, what the hell was I thinking? So actors, let's talk about actors. Um, you guys can really help me on these two things, options and continuity. And I know what you're thinking right now. You're going, Tao's gone off the deep end because options and continuity are diametrically opposed. But what I'm talking about when it, comes to content, when it comes to options is don't give me four takes of the same thing. And your directors should be helping you out with this. But if I have four takes and your read is exactly the same, I got one take, right? So 
Give me different takes. I need those options. When I talk about continuity, I mean continuity of action. Um, if you're a stage actor that's moving into film acting, you have to understand continuity. If you deliver the first sentence, take a sip of coffee, put it down, deliver the second sentence, you need to do that on take two, you need to do that on take 12, you need to do that on take 156, as long as you weren't fired at take 150. <laughs> right? <laughs> it was the sound guy's fault. We fired him. So I, got, I have to have that continuity. So just take a mental note of those things when you're acting. Um, make sure you do that same motion every time. You're not going to get it 100% of the time. And I'm fine with that. You know, that we, we got to work together. But try and get it as much as you can. Spacious editing is fun editing. What do I mean by that? I need space. I need space on lines. Don't just dive in with that line. Give it a little space so I have room to edit. Now, I know the argument from actors is, well, there's times when I, that, that can't be done. I've got to be talking over the other character just because that's the way it needs to play. And I will agree with you. But we go back to options. Give me options. When they shoot the wide, talk over them if you want. But when it gets to coverage, when they're shooting me over the shoulders, Give me that option of not talking over, right? So now I've got options to work with. If you feel that, that, that there's a need to have that over talk, do it in the wide shot, but don't do it in the, in the over the shoulders. Don't do it in coverage. Give me that option. Okay, I used to play hockey. That's me like in 1998. I was a lot skinnier then. If any of you know anything about hockey, I was a goalie. This is a really bad position to be in because I'm not coming out and cutting down the angle. So I'm giving a lot of net. And I know right now you guys think I've really gone off the deep end. But the reason I've done this is because somebody told me once, if you want to make a point, use an analogy. So I'm going to use an analogy here. I know that nobody scored on this. And the reason they didn't score is you can look that the puck is off here to the right. And there ain't nobody on the left. So I can make that save easy, because there's nobody skating without the puck. And as an actor, if you want to score, and score to actors is what? Screen time. You want screen time, right? If you want to score, you have to skate without the puck. And what do I mean by that? Don't just act. React. I can't tell you how many times I've had footage where an actor delivers a line, and then just sits there, stone-faced. That does nothing for me. React to what's happening. Don't just act, react. Skate without the puck, please. Because I can use that all over the place. I can use that for character development. I can use it to bridge a scene. So please, don't just act, react. Don't screw the focus puller. <laughs> They're notorious for having STDs. <laughs> Actually, what I mean by that is understand nowadays people are shooting big chips. People are shooting really shallow depth of field. Um, people are shooting scenes where, as an actor, your face is in focus and your ears out of focus, right? So what does that mean when it comes to movement? It means that you have plenty, you can move it in X. You know, anybody know what difference between X, Y, and Z? X is this way, Y is this way, Z is depth. As an actor with that much depth of field, if you start moving in Z space, you're out of focus. So talk to your director, talk to your DP, know how much room you have to work with, right? And your focus puller will love you if you do that. Okay, a little bit about, a little bit of stuff for editors. And you know that editors are my favorite people. Why? <laughs> because, of course, they're the most important people on any film. And they agree. Um, this is a clip from Inmate 14658. This just screened in the San Diego 48-hour uh, film project, won Best Actress, Best Cinematography. Uh, the scene you're about to see has Kristen Chandler as Margaret McCarthy, an interpreter, which was the, which was the required character. Laurie and Hill Purcell plays Renata Hogart. 
she's an inmate. Um, the interesting story behind this is we got an interpreter for the character, and it just so happened that Lorian Hill Purcell spoke Afrikaans, which is this goofy Dutch version of Dutch from South Africa. So, hell yeah, we're going to use that. <laughs> So, but this is also a really good example of, of actors reacting as, a, you know, as, as well as acting. And I will also add that I was amazed that I had so many great reaction shots to choose from because, because of timing, our actors couldn't be on set all the time. So for the majority of this, these actors were acting to flip in cue cards. They were acting to the director. They had nobody to act off of. So, and this is a really good example of some reaction shots that I can't believe I got. Here we go. But I have learned that it was not against God. The crimes I have committed were not against God, they were against evil men. The more is when I get to the mark on men's look, yes. Murder is when you kill a human being. These were not human beings. <laughs> The humiliation you feel when you are punched and thrown face down on the floor. With your hair out, and your hair off, and her veil all up on you. Ripping your hair out, throwing you down, and forcing themselves on you. Hella think that it's krach on the cut your boy. They think there is power in watching you bleed. I hate to think that some more like this on the person to do it, Mark. I thought it would be harder to kill a person, but it wasn't. She didn't seem to have any regrets. No, what I did was just and right. Men think that they can rule us with their muscle, but we are smarter. You don't have to be big and strong to kill. When they hurt you, you lose a piece of your soul. So that was Inmate. I loved editing that film. That film was so much fun to edit because it was so much about subtle character development. The whole plot line in that film is that you have this, you have this individual who's a prisoner who's about to be put to death um, for murdering her uh, abusive boyfriend. And in the same time as she's giving her last statement to the warden, she also realizes that the interpreter is being abused and is giving the interpreter instructions on how to do it to her boyfriend, how to take care of her boyfriend. So it was such subtle editing. It was all about the turn on the character, the character realizing it. And that turn for me in that edit was, you don't have to be big and strong to kill. And the turn was the reaction shot. It was the reaction shot of Kristen Chandler. So actors react. Editors, be organized. Organization allows you to be creative. If you have to go, every moment you spend looking for a piece of footage is, is just wasted time and it ruins that creative flow. You know, you get that creative flow going and all of a sudden, oh God, I gotta go find footage. And I, you know, every, it seems like every editor has a different way to organize, but find one that works for you um, and use it. Uh, lately, I, I st I've started using Final Cut 10 and 
I know, it's, oh my God, he's using Final Cut 10. But I found that it's the most valuable tool out there for me when it comes to organizing footage. It allows me to organize in so many ways that every time I use it, I go, why didn't I organize it that way? You know, I find a new way to do it. So find something that works for you, organize. Um, editors, be a musician or at least be a lover of music. I think the best editors out there are musically inclined because music has so much to do with pacing, so much to do with tempo, and you can take that into your editing because the human voice has certain pacing and tempo. And if you wind up cutting where people would put commas or periods in their speech, it's very easy, it's very flowing. But on the other hand, if you're editing where people wouldn't normally put spaces, it's disjointed. Right? And if you understand music and pacing and emotion that music can give you, it will help your edit so much more. So just go take a piano lesson. Go take a drum lesson. Or just put headphones on and listen to music. And understand how that music makes you feel. What emotions does it bring in you? Hone your people skills. Oh, you've got to do it. I just saw the look, but you've got to do it. <laughs> Because, you know, a lot of times I've spoken, I've spoken at colleges and, and you know, the, the inevitable question always comes up. Well, what's the most important skill I can have as an editor? You know what the most important skill you can have? The ability to not slug a producer that desperately needs a slugging <laughs> in the middle of an edit. Because you're a salesman, man. You're, if you're an editor, you're a salesman. You're trying to sell your ideas. So you really have to hone your people skills. Um, be open-minded as an editor. Don't think that your idea is the best. I cannot tell you how many times that Mike Brugemeyer and I have sat in an edit session and he said, well, why don't we try this? And I go, nah, that'll suck. And then we try it and it don't suck. <laughs> Sometimes it's really, really good. You know, and the opposite has been true. You know, I've said to Brugemeyer, let's try this. No, nah, that'll never work. We try it, it friggin' works beautifully. So just be open-minded, try, try things especially nowadays with non-linear editing, come on. It's a word processor for video. Move stuff around, see what happens. You know, when, when I remember, I remember when non-linear first started coming out and everybody went, well, it's so much faster to edit now. No, no, it's not any faster because now the client can keep changing right up to the very last minute. <laughs> so it doesn't get any faster, but you do get more options and with more options, you get a better piece, right? Um, so in conclusion, I'll wrap this thing up. Filmmaking is a team sport. Everyone on your film is the most important person on your film. Seriously. Sometimes the best idea comes from the secretary. So be open-minded. You know, everybody is a part of that team. Again, three things to remember when it comes to your editor. Think about what you're going to do and whether it will help his or her organization, his or her options, and continuity. Think of those three things, because those are the three things we want most from you. Um, so time for questions, and that's my contact information. Wow, there's way too much contact information these days, <laughs> isn't there? So uh, email, Facebook. What's your name? My name is Michael Tao. Um, that's my email, my Facebook. That's the Facebook for my company, M2 Digital Post. That's Twitter. I'm really trying to be a Twitter guy, but I just never seem to be really good at it. I wind up just going back to Facebook. Because really, to me, if you go to my personal Facebook, you'll find that to me, Facebook is really just a smart-ass response contest for me. I'm just trying to be the most smart-ass guy on Facebook. That's my website. If you, have, if you have any questions, please email them to me. I would be happy to answer. I'm, I'm a very firm believer. We can, we can take a few uh, Q&A now. Cool. You know, so any questions now so you can avoid that? Go for it, Joe. Uh, let me hang on, Joe. Oh, you get the mic. OK, um, as I learn editing and directing and filmmaking, everybody talks about the line and not crossing the line. Right. Now, everything I read or talk to or hear is all about not crossing the line in a particular scene. Right. I want to talk about the line of continuity from scene to scene, if, if you know what I'm talking about. Yes, and I would say, I think I know what you're asking. If it comes down to, do I, do I retain continuity or do I retain the better performance? 
take the better performance every time. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Well, if you have somebody that's that's going off the screen this way, they should come on this way, but now they're coming on the wrong yeah. way, yeah. smack your director. <laughs> because I'm you're really you're screwed in post. There's not really a whole lot you can do with that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's, it goes back to what I said. Take that 10 seconds to think about screen direction. But, but, but what I thought you were asking about was, you know, if you have a problem with continuity, um, if, if there's a better performance that has a continuity problem and a worse performance that retains continuity, take the better performance. Um, yeah, take the better performance because people will forgive that stuff and it'll give them something to look for later. Okay, we have time for a few short questions, so I'll hold. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. Uh, Mike, first of all, very, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation, really. Um, what is your feeling about storyboards? Do you find them as an editor useful, useless, hurtful? Um, um, to be honest with you, I really don't work with storyboards that often because most of the stuff I'm doing um, winds up being corporate stuff, and a lot of times nobody has budgets for storyboards, so they just don't get done. Um, in the edit, are storyboards helpful? Yeah, I could see there where they would be helpful. I think they're probably more helpful visualizing in production, you know, when you're on set shooting. Great question. At what point is the, uh, do you get involved with the, uh, with the director get, uh, not the director, the editor? Uh, I'm so confused, you put all that stuff up there. <laughs> what point do you get involved with the movie? Is it like table read later on or, or what point? As an editor? Yes. Um, I, like to, I like to read the script and see what it is and get it in my brain. I would say before you go into production, meet with your editor to, again, work out any of those workflow issues that you may have. You know, work out, we're going to shoot with this camera, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, you know, and work those workflows out. So I would say before you, before you shoot, get with your editor. We have a question here. Earlier in the uh, presentation, you talked about poor focus in some of the shots yeah. in 40 hour. So if you're um, torn between telling the story with a poorly focused shot, mm -hmm. do you do it or do you edit around it? Um, it depends on how well the sharpen filter will work. <laughs> I mean, honestly, that's the answer. I mean, I've had to do that with shots. If it's a little bit out of focus, you can drop a sharpen filter on it and sharpen it up a little bit. I, I really am a believer in using the performance that tells the story best. I mean, unless it's totally hosed up and you really can't use it. And to be honest with you, that's the worst feeling in the world for an editor. When you have a really great shot and it's just screwed up. I mean, I'm a big guy and I like steak. That's like putting a porterhouse out of my reach, man. <laughs> I mean, it just, it sucks when it's a really good performance and it's out of focus or whatever. Okay, at this point, we're going to wrap it up, do the prizes. And uh, Michael's going to be here for uh, at least till 9 o'clock, so any other questions? Or you can refer to that list, go to Facebook, and, and look at his smart remarks. And, and, no, and seriously, <laughs> if you have questions, send me email, because I, I'm a firm believer of filmmakers helping out other, other filmmakers. So send me questions if you have them. I'll be happy to answer. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Thanks, man. Awesome. Thanks. Don't go away. I'll stay right here. Awesome presentation. Okay, once again, a round of applause for Michael Tower. Thanks, guys.